right. Y'all ready for our next presentation? You know, I have managed the local Catholic radio station for about 17 years now. And oftentimes, uh, thank you. with people is, you know, what program do you like? What's your favorite show? And I'd say for 17 years, it's been pretty consistently, there's a lot of great shows, I won't list them all, but I, I would hear Catholic Answers Live. It's just, uh, it's a very popular show. It's on it during drive time in the afternoon, and it's very well done, and that's been kind of a go-to favorite show. But the last four or five years or so, there's another show that has been creeping up, and we're hearing as often, if not sometimes even more often, it's the most popular show on Catholic Radio, and it's, it's called Call of the Community. And it's this soft-spoken man from Birmingham, Alabama, who answers questions from nine Catholics, and phenomenally successful show. And I'm sure many of y'all would say it's your favorite show on Catholic Radio. And we happen to have the host of Call of the Community uh, here with us today, and we're honored to have him, Dr. David Anders, was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. He began his college career at Tulane University in New Orleans, where he met his wife, but they both completed their degrees at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Dr. David Anders earned his BA from Wheaton in 1992, an MA from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in 1995, and a PhD from the University of Iowa in 2012, where we studied Reformation history and historical theology. Dr. Anders taught history and religion in Iowa, Alabama, and he currently resides in Birmingham, Alabama, with his wife and five homeschooled children. His show, by the way, at 1 o'clock every afternoon. It's a tremendous live calling show, and so please, we're honored to have him here with us. Dr. David Thank you very much for having me. It's been a, it's a great pleasure to speak to you today. I've had such a wonderful time getting to know some of you uh, you know, over the last four hours. Um, so as Dave mentioned, I host a show for EWTN. The show is Call to Communion. Uh, it's for non-Catholics, and the tagline is, What's Stopping You from Becoming a Catholic? And uh, I, I, yeah, I've had some answers to that question. My favorite one was a fellow that called and said, Dr. Anders, you're always asking what's not people from becoming a Catholic. I've been listening to your show for about six months now, and I can say with some assurance that what's not people from becoming a Catholic is you. <laughs> um, but my, my qualification, so to speak, for the show, not just that I have a degree in theology, but that I grew up extremely non-Catholic vehemently non-Catholic, raised in an evangelical Protestant tradition. And uh, I went to graduate school intent on debunking the claims of the Catholic Church. And I had probably every objection to Catholicism that you could imagine. And of course I was eventually disabused. And so when people call and ask me questions, I'm right there with them. I sympathize because I was I was in their boat. Uh, and typically I hear the same objections over and over again. You know, why do Catholics worship Mary? Where is purgatory in the Bible? Uh, you know, what about the clerical abuse crisis? But about a year ago, I heard a new objection, one that I had never heard before, and those are always my favorite, you know, something new. I heard from a young man who called me up and he said, Dr. Anders, I want to tell you why I left the church. I said, okay, why did you leave? He said, I left the church because of her teaching about the Eucharist. Actually, that's a new one. It usually goes the other way around. People are attracted to the church because they're attracted to the Eucharist. And so again, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, I was told that the Eucharist was the best thing in the world, that it would change my life, that I would go to communion and I'd never be the same. And so I went to RCIA, and I learned the faith, and I professed the faith, and I was baptized and confirmed in Easter. And I went forward to Holy Communion, and I received communion, and I felt nothing. I felt unchanged. 
I thought, well, maybe it has to build up in my system for a while. So I kept at it, you know, for six weeks, nine weeks, 12 weeks. And I was just the same old guy. Nothing seemed to be different. And so I came to the conclusion that the church's teaching was a lie, that I had been sold a bill of goods. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So what was going on here with this young man? What were his expectations? Now, from his point of view, everyone had told him that the Eucharist was the big thing, that it would change his life, that it would make him feel different. He would think different. And I suspect that many of you have heard those kinds of appeals. I understand where he was coming from, and yet he did not feel any different. His life was unchanged, and given his expectations, given what he had been taught, I think he was right to feel cheated, right to feel disappointed, because I also recognize that he had been badly taught about the Eucharist and given false expectations. He knew about the real presence, to be sure, oh yes, but there was something else that he did not know. Now we know that the Eucharist is the source of the sum of the Catholic faith, but do we know how? We know that Christ is really present in the Blessed Sacrament, but do we know how that's supposed to make a difference in our lives? St. Ignatius of Antioch said the Eucharist was the medicine of immortality, but do we know how it's supposed to change us? The medical metaphor makes it sound pharmacological. Is that how the Eucharist works? Is it like a pill? And does it matter if you know how it works? Pills work, whether you know how they work or not. And what are the effects of the Eucharist? Is it supposed to change the way we feel, like a psychoactive drug? Now there are Catholics who know the Church's teaching, but who, when pressed, would be hard pressed to answer these questions. So what I want to do today is I want to address these questions and other questions with reference to the idea of a relationship with Christ. In the last 30 years, it's become increasingly common in Catholic circles to speak about having a relationship with Christ. And in truth, this is not traditional Catholic language. The phraseology comes from Protestantism. But the popes have embraced it and have said that this is an appropriate way to describe Catholic spirituality. And so what are we talking about? A failure to understand this, how to relate to Christ, whether in the Blessed Sacrament or in other areas of Catholic life, leads to disappointment, to disillusionment, like this young man experienced. Now, the idea of relationship suggests conversation, dialogue, mutual empathetic exchange, the intimacy of friends. Is this what we mean? Jesus did say, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Is that what we're looking for? Let me tell you another story. I was working in a book manuscript one time, and I had parked myself at a local coffee shop, Starbucks. I was writing away about the relationship with Jesus. And I couldn't help overhearing a conversation between a man and a young woman, and they were talking about the relationship with Christ. And this fellow was telling this girl, I'm going to teach you how to hear from God. And he said, what you do is, you tell God to speak to you, and then you blank your mind, and the first thing that pops in your head, that's God talking to you. This is what I call the Harvey the Invisible Rabbit view of Jesus. In 1950, Jimmy Stewart started the movie called Harvey. Uh, it's about a man who has a relationship with an invisible rabbit. And he talks to him, and they go out for drinks together, and nobody else can see him but their best friends. And we, the audience, are not really sure if there's a Harvey or not. My conversation partner, my confidant, my drinking buddy. One of these two stories happened to happen. In both cases, we're talking about people who were looking for an immediate, sensible encounter with God. Maybe something as tangible as a conversation with my friend. It's something that feels different from ordinary experience, something extraordinary. It wouldn't be wrong, I think, to compare what they're looking for to the kind of rush that people get from drug use from extreme sports. Is this what relationship with Christ is? Is it an overwhelming feeling? 
Now, Dave Morney's band are fantastic, and I thoroughly enjoyed their music this morning. And I love the genre as much as anyone. But there's also another movement, particularly in Protestant Christianity, we'll call it the worship movement, that imagines that they feel Holy Spirit in the rush of positive emotion in response to moving music. If you've ever been to a Protestant megachurch, you know the worship leader will sometimes say something like, couldn't you feel the Holy Spirit's presence today? And what they really mean is, didn't you all have a positive emotional response? Is that what we mean by relationship to Christ? You know, I used to be in that camp. I had a brief sojourn in the early 90s in the Pentecostal charismatic movement before I was a Catholic. And I went to one of these churches, and there was great music, and we were all deeply moved. And of course, this was charismatic, so we were all speaking in tongues and hooting and hollering like anybody's business. And I was able to invest in arms raised, speaking in tongues, carrying on. And a man in front of me turned around and looked at me, and he said, Brother, you are filled with the Spirit of God. And in a flash, the dream ended. I came crashing down because I knew in an instant how wrong he was. I knew that my frenetic emotional effluvia was nothing other than my sense of loss, my sense of alienation, my, my insecurity, my longing for God, born out of a kind of neurotic eagerness to reach out and be touched. But I knew that it wasn't the Spirit of God because I knew what was going on in my own moral life. Now there's nothing wrong with worship music or powerful emotion. And sometimes God really does speak to people in a special way, what we call private revelation. But the church says that none of these things is really the relationship that we're seeking to establish with Christ. And if we make those things normative, if we make them primary, it can be quite dangerous. There's a non-Catholic sociologist named Tanya Lorman who's written a wonderful book on evolution in American religion. It's called When God Talks Back. And what she points out is uh, there's this new spirituality that's swept the American scene and the idea is that people identify some internal state, some thought, some emotion, as the unique token or sign of God's presence. As in, you know, whenever you feel this, that's God talking to you. And the practitioner doesn't recognize this as a sign or a token. They just think that's a direct and immediate encounter with God. Now this mistake, this mistaking my own thoughts, my own emotions for God, well, that can become a species of idolatry and it becomes quite dangerous. There's a Canadian Protestant evangelist who believes quite literally that he can heal people by kicking them in the face. I won't tell you his name, but I'm not making this up. In one YouTube clip, he said, he says, and I'm thinking, why is the power of God not moving? And God said to me, it's because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping in front of the platform, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and the gift of faith came on me, and God said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. And I came closer, and I went, bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell on the power of God. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. So when I read this, it makes me think of a passage from St. Teresa of Avila. Teresa says, there may be some who are so weak in intellect and imagination, I have known such, that they believe they actually see all they imagine. Teresa was one of the greatest contemplatives in church history. She knew all about spiritual experience, but she was extremely wary of people equating their emotional absorption with the Spirit of God. She said people abandon themselves to this kind of absorption and the more they relax, the more complete the absorption becomes. And so they get it into their head that it's some kind of spiritual rapture. But I call it foolishness. For they're doing nothing but wasting their time and ruining their health. This is something that Cardinal Radson, who went on to become Pope Benedict the 16th, was also spoken about. He said false charismatics identify the grace of the Holy Spirit with their psychological experience. In opposing them, the fathers insisted on the fact that the soul's union with God in prayer is realized in a mysterious way, and in particular through the sacraments of the church. 
Moreover, it can even be achieved through experiences of affliction or desolation. You know, one of the most common calls I get on the show is for people who are bereft, people who are in mourning, people who have experienced loss, people who want to know where God is in their suffering, in their alienation, in their loneliness. And I understand this. In recent years, my family went through a number of really profound tragedies that I cannot talk about publicly, that, that literally tore us apart. I felt my heart was pulled out of my chest and stomped into pieces on the ground. And I found the greatest comfort in the Psalms of dereliction. Psalm 88, Lord, why do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. This is inspired scripture. This is in the Bible for a reason. Relationship with Christ is compatible with wretched pain, total rejection, and soul-crushing silence from heaven. Mother Teresa, we now know, lived for years in this kind of abject psychological condition. And yet few people would seem to have been closer to Christ. So what is a relationship to Christ? Sacred scripture and sacred tradition offer us another way of understanding this. In the life of St. Paul, we encounter someone with a powerful relationship to Christ. And his relationship with Christ becomes a model for all the Christians. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now Paul did have extraordinary experience. He saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, and he had visions of heaven. And the church says that such things happen, but Paul did not make them the basis for Christian spirituality. He never wrote about meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, and what he said about his visions was quite indirect or ironic at best. Instead, the key for Paul was that he changed his mind about the very people he was persecuting. So from now on, he says, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what is he talking about? You know, Paul was something of a Jewish biblical fundamentalist who took the Old Testament prescriptions at face value. And so, in thinking he would bring about the kingdom of God, he went about killing those that didn't conform with his understanding of Jewish life. The law says, kill seventh graders. He was killing seventh graders. In Paul's world, Jews and Gentiles were separated from the wall of the Mosaic Law. And this literal reading of the Old Testament led Paul to become a murderer, to kill those who would call, to those who, those who violated what he took to be a sacred boundary. But then he was struck blind by Christ on his way to Damascus. And he didn't regain his sight until he entered the church in the company of those he once despised. Ananias of Damascus laid hands on Paul, and he received his sight in baptism. And from that moment on, Paul did not simply adopt a new ethical code. He received a new perspective. His eyes were opened, and he was able to experience God in the persons he once thought were his enemies. He would eventually call this having the mind of Christ. This is the key to St. Paul's relationship to Christ. He wasn't seeing Christ in a vision. He wasn't hearing Christ whisper in his head. And he wasn't feeling the swell of positive emotion arise from the amplifiers of contemporary music. It was that he came to internalize Christ's personality. He came to see the world through Jesus' eyes. Pope Benedict XVI explains, he says, faith does not merely gaze at Jesus, but sees things as Jesus sees them, with his own eyes. It is a participation in his way of seeing. Now this is what the church calls illumination, and it's a critical step on the path to union with God. 
We're not talking about simply what you learn in the catechism or your ability to recite the creed. We're talking about an interior transformation. Ephesians 1.18, Paul says, I pray that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In the ancient church, they called baptism illumination to underscore this change of perspective, being able to see through Christ's eyes. In the Easter Vigil Liturgy, we say, the light of Christ, thanks be to God. You know, in the Gospel of John, this image of light predominates. I find it over and over again. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. And it's a light that we can share when Christ comes to dwell in our hearts. John 14, Jesus says, If you love me, you can keep my commandments. The Father and I will come to them. I'll come to you and make my dwelling with you. You know, growing up in the evangelical church, I heard all the time that Jesus has to live in my heart. I invite Jesus to come live in your heart. I didn't know what that meant as a little kid. I thought I'd have a, you know, a little tiny homuncular Jesus living someplace over in the left atrium. I told this story many times, and I used to say left aorta, but I have cardiologists today tell me, Andrews, there's no such thing as the left aorta. You have to say left atrium. Um, so how does Jesus dwell in our hearts? What does the church say? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas says that Christ dwells in us as the known is in the knower, and the beloved is in the lover. Anyone who is married and loves their wife knows what that's like. Your wife is not literally hanging out someplace in your left atrium, but you've come to internalize her perspective. You know what she likes. You know what she doesn't want. You know what she fears. You know what her aspirations are. And you come to share those as your own. And Aristotle says a friend is like having a second self. A spouse is like that. It's like you have another you that you're looking out for. Internally, you've internalized that person's perspective. This is the way in which Christ comes to dwell within us. Now, this is not the kind of knowledge that you gain simply from the Baltimore Catechism or from the recitation of the Creed. It is, it is a change in your inner being. And that's why Paul can say, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And having been rooted and established in love, you may have power with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This is a knowing that is not merely proposition, it's not merely verbal or discursive. This is a knowing by way of participation. And this is what the church says about relationship to Christ. We obey his teaching, we imitate his example, and ultimately we come to internalize his personality. Everything else in the faith is ordered to this end. It's what Jesus called the one thing necessary. St. Teresa says, all the believer in prayer has to do, and you must not forget this, for it is very important, is to labor and be resolute and to prepare yourself with all possible diligence to bring your will into conformity with the will of God. Now what I want to do for the rest of the time today is discuss some of the means that Christ left us to do this, the tools to help bring our will in conformity to the will of Christ, especially the scriptures, the sacraments, and the church. Now, earlier I spoke about a man who thought that Jesus would talk straight in his head, and the evangelist that wanted to kick people in the face. Um, or the young man who was disappointed with the Eucharist because it seemed to lack this, the immediacy of tangible contact. Tangible contact. And, uh, but as Catholics, we recognize that there is a very real and important way, a sense in which Christ is physically absent from us. He said to the disciples, I'm going away, and I'll come back. In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. To Mary Magdalene, he says, don't hold on to me, for I haven't ascended to the Father. The Catholic tradition takes this distance very seriously. Jesus is removed from us. We don't experience Christ with that kind of immediacy that the disciples did. And there's a significant note of longing in the Catholic tradition, even though it's a longing filled with joy. St. Peter says, you have not seen him, and yet you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. 
for your receiving at the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. By acknowledging this, by celebrating it, we're able to avoid what century so warned against. We avoid that idolatry of divinizing our own imagination. We rely on the, the means that Christ gave us. Our relationship with Christ is mediated. You can't avoid approaching Christ through mediations, but as Catholics, we have the confidence that the means we use were instituted by Christ. Let's start with the scriptures. How are Catholics to read the Bible? You know, I grew up in this Protestant tradition that regarded the Bible as the rule of faith. I thought everything that the Bible said was literally true. You could exit the scripture, you could formulate it as a system, uh, and you would have a comprehensive account of reality in the Christian life. And anything that contradicted that was just flat wrong. And so, you know, it led us to some really useful conclusions, like, uh, if you put together an archaeological dig and climbed to the top, top of Mount Ararat, you would be sure to find the remnants of Noah's Ark. That, that, was, that was the value that I derived from Genesis chapter 6. Uh, it taught me, for example, that all of uh, professional biology and geology must be a satanic ploy, right? because it contradicted what I understood to be the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. In other words, I was reading the Bible in a way that Paul called the letter that leads to death. Because that way of reading the Bible was not, in fact, inwardly transformative for me. It made me cocksure and arrogant and put me at odds with my culture and with reason. But it did nothing to create charity within me. It just created hubris and pride. That's not the way Bibles, excuse me, not the way Catholics are to read the Bible. Catholics do revere the Bible, but we don't read the Bible as our rule of faith, as a comprehensive textbook to answer all questions in the Christian life. You get a better idea of how Catholics read the Bible from the way we treat sacred scripture at Mass. We proclaim the Bible as the word of the Lord. We stand for the reading of the Gospel. We cross ourselves in prayer so that these words can penetrate our minds and hearts. St. Paul uh, his transformation led him to some radical conclusions about the interpretation of Scripture. According to Paul, there are two ways of reading the Bible, what he called the letter that kills and the spirit that gives life. The first way is to read the Bible the way he used to, as a tool to divide, to conquer, to oppress. And the second way is to read the Bible in order to acquire the mind of Christ. St. Augustine, in the first great treatise on biblical hermeneutics in Catholic history on Christian doctrine, says, any interpretation of Scripture is the right one if it leads to charity. The first way comes naturally to us. The second one comes only with the gift of the Spirit, which is why the Church calls it the spiritual sin. The spiritual sense is grounded in the teaching of Christ himself. Jesus, of course, was willing to depart from the literal prescriptions of the Old Testament in order to find a deeper reading that led to love. Think about the woman called in adultery in John chapter 8, where Jesus is teaching on divorce in Matthew 19, two places where he was willing to depart from the literal sense in service of a deeper and more spiritual aim. Now, Jesus' whole ministry was oriented away from the pedantic insistence upon rules and texts and towards transformative experience. His central message was the kingdom of God is here. Not the recitation of a creed or a doctrinal confession, but a proclamation and a call to conversion. And his teaching style was oriented this way as well. We read St. Mark's Gospel. Another time, Jesus went to the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. What did he do? Couldn't Jesus have healed this man on Monday or Sunday? Could he put him back out in the guy's house? But no, he waits till the Sabbath. It makes a show of it. He puts him in front of the whole community and says, stand up. And then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life, to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed that their stubborn hearts said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. 
Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill him. What clear doctrinal truth did Christ articulate in this passage? None whatsoever. He didn't offer a single assertion. He put forth no proposition to be believed or obeyed. Instead, he asked a question. Is it lawful to do good? And he made a provocation. You see, his goal here was to elicit a response, to demonstrate to his audience their own hypocrisy. He was, in other words, trying to provoke a moral change. Most of his ministry has this character. His disciples eating with unwashed hands, eating with tax collectors and sinners. These are deliberately transgressive and provocative behaviors meant to elicit realization, transformation, illumination, a shift in perspective on the part of his hearers. And this is especially true of Christ's parables. Why did Jesus teach parables? You know, when I was in graduate school, I used to be a teaching assistant for a large class called the Judeo-Christian Tradition. We had about 800 students, and I think probably about 10 teaching assistants. And our job was to write the exams and grade the exams and, and to run discussion groups for the, the large lectures. And uh, the TAs were from different traditions. We had people studying Christianity, people studying New Testament, people studying Hinduism and other, you know, Buddhism, anything that was in the religion department. So not everybody there was well versed in the Bible. And the head TA was a Jewish woman. And uh, we would get together in groups and work together to come up with good exam questions and, and multiple choice answers. And uh, one time I remember the question came up, uh, why does Jesus teach in parables? We were going to make this an exam question. And, uh, uh, and the head TA said, well, you know, the right answer is obviously because parables are so easy to understand. And of course, every New Testament scholar in the room went, um, he actually says the opposite. All right? Matthew 13, Jesus' disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. Excuse me? Jesus just said that he speaks in parables because he does not want to be easily understood. What's up with that? Here might be useful to consider the nature of a parable. Parables were part of the Hebrew prophetic tradition. So let's look at the way the prophet Nathan used the parable of the poor shepherd to rebuke King David. David hears Nathan tell of a poor man who had only one ewe, a sheep he loved like one of his own children. He lived near a rich man who had many sheep. But when the rich man entertained the guest, he took the poor man's one sheep away from him to slaughter and serve his guest. When David heard the story, he became furious and he insisted, the man who did this must die. But Nathan responded, you are that man. For David had stolen Bathsheba away from Uriah the Hittite and had had the man murdered. Nathan's parable was not a simple moral lesson. It was a tool to get David to recognize the gravity of his crimes. It was his gotcha. The meaning of the parable was not obvious to David, and that's the point. David didn't have an opportunity to formulate a defense, and because of that, the parable was able to provoke a moral insight. This is what Christ's parables do. Think about the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the workers in the vineyard. They are not simply moral lessons. They're opportunities to see ourselves in a new light. We don't simply walk away with a moral platitude like be kind to travelers. We get an opportunity to see ourselves in the persons of the older brother, in the prodigal son, or in the priests and Levites in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, there are many other episodes in Scripture where Jesus refuses to give a straight answer, where his purpose, obviously, is not simply to convey information. One of my favorites is in Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10, a man runs up to Jesus, kneels before him, and asks, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if ever there was an opportunity for Christ to give a clear answer, this would be it. But Jesus' response is confusing. Why do you call me good? 
There's no one good but God alone. You know the commandments, keep them. In other words, you already know what to do. Leave me alone. It's as if Christ were dismissing him. Well, you know the end of the story. The other man says, I have kept him. I have kept him. And then only St. Mark's version of the story says this. St. Mark says, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. The importance of personal regard. Do you know why people join the church? David Yamane, a sociologist from Chapel Hill. No, Wake Forest, I'm sorry. Sociologist from Wake Forest has written a book on RCA in the United States, Coming Catholic. He concludes what I think anybody who's ever told me in RCA already knows this. The vast majority of people who become Catholic do so through personal relationships. Someone reached out to them, someone knew them, someone married them. And why do people leave the church? For the same reason. People are alienated, people are ignored, people are dismissed, people are treated badly. It's not generally a reduction. I know of a woman who was in dire personal straits. And she was invited by a religious sister to come visit her in the convent. And so she went. And the Mother Superior wandered by. She saw the woman and she knew something about her personal troubles. And she thought, oh, she's come here to bring her to the convent. Didn't realize she was there by invitation. And she dismissed her and said, you know, you can't come here looking for help. Well, she guaranteed that woman is never going to come back to the church looking for help ever again. Christ said to the man, there's one thing you lack. Sell what you have, give to the poor, come and follow me. It's not until the man basically recognized that he needs to go deeper, that Christ really challenges him with an invitation to follow him, to join his band of itinerant disciples. And it's important to realize that Christ's words here are not just a universal moral prescription. It's not just a moral platitude. The church is clear about this. In other instances, Jesus tells people not to follow him. Uh, the man possessed by demons, for example, wants to follow Jesus, and Jesus refuses. He sends him home and says, go home and tell your friends all that God has done for you. The response to the man in Mark 10 seems like a target response to a specific individual aimed at least in part to provoke a deeper insight into his moral condition. So how do we now, in this day and age, appropriate this? How can we enter into this reading of the scriptures and allow Christ to provoke us, to provoke an insight in us? Well, one approach is to take the approach of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius proposes in a spiritual exercise that you use your imagination. Place yourself in the narratives of scripture, especially the gospels. See yourself on the mountain hearing the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to the parables. Walk with Jesus on the road to Bethany, from Bethany to Jerusalem. Enter with him into the upper room. And the goal is clearly not to gain information. It's to be affected, to be transformed. So what I'm emphasizing so far, again, is that for a Catholic, relationship to Christ is mostly about changing our character to become more like Christ. And what I want you to see from the Gospels is that this is how Jesus himself taught. It wasn't simply what he said, but even how he said it. Jesus really didn't mind if people agreed with him or not. He wasn't trying to intellectually persuade. He was trying to convert. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Now, in addition to his verbal teaching and his provocative demonstrations, the other thing that Christ did of great significance was to institute the sacraments. Baptize in the name of the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Forgive the sins. Do this in memory of me. What I want to suggest to you is that Christ's use of the sacraments is very similar to his use of parables. The purpose of the sacrament is not to expound the faith, but to elicit it, to evoke it, to demonstrate it. The sacramental mode has this power about it that it works on a level beyond mere verbal description. Like the parables, sacraments are adapted to help us internalize the person of Christ. But how? As Catholics, we understand that the sacraments are supernaturally powerful tools to transform our lives. 
they're not merely symbols. But many Catholics make the mistakes of forgetting that they are also symbols. And the key to their efficacy is to understand how these two things relate, how the supernatural power, power of God, present in the sacrament, and our appropriation, our internalization of the meaning of the symbol work together. If we properly attend to the symbol, the meaning of the sacrament, they can more effectively imprint upon our souls. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. When I was in college, I was at Wheaton College, which is an evangelical Protestant school in Chicago. And uh, they had a, a chapel there, it was a prayer chapel. Imagine a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel without the Eucharist. That's what it looked like. But they did have something, a table, rather like an altar, they called it an altar. And uh, people would go in there and pray quietly and solemnly. But you were allowed to write your prayer intentions anonymously on a sticky note and put it on the so-called altar. So you'd be in there and you'd be praying for a while by yourself, and then you might wander up and pick these things up and, and pray for your fellow Christians. And I would do this frequently. And I found after a while that many of those sticky notes were more than like confessions of sin. They were, uh, I'm struggling with this, uh, please help me. I have this weakness, please pray for me. And uh, it, it, it wasn't until years later that I reflected back on the experience and thought, you know, here are these people coming into, you know, a darkened room and unburdening themselves and seeking a word of comfort. Wouldn't it be nice if God could whisper to you, it's okay, I've got this. And of course, when I finally became Catholic, I had that experience. I went to my first confession, and I unburdened myself, and I knew the doctrine of the church at this point, I knew the scriptures, and I knew that Christ had given the church authority, whoever sins you forgive, or forgive it, whoever sins you retain or attain. And so when the priest said to me, God sent the Holy Spirit of my to forgive us of sins, through the ministry of the church, and I knew the significance of those words, may God grant you pardon and peace and absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I had that experience. I had a tangible point of conflict, contact, and that's what we long for, right? But as a sign, with the confidence that together with the sign, there was the reality. You see, the sign and the reality are working together. And this is the case with all of the sacraments, even the Eucharist. In 1925, the great Benedictine abbot and theologian Oscar Bonnier wrote a book entitled The Key to the Doctrine of the Eucharist. And what do you think he said was the key? He said the key is to remember that the Eucharist is a sacrament. What? Don't we all know that the Eucharist is a sacrament? But he had something very specific in mind. Because it is a sacrament, the Eucharist is both the reality of Christ's body and it is a sign. What's being signified? Pope Pius XII, his famous encyclical on the liturgy, Mediatri Dei, says, In the Eucharist we have two elements. We have bread and wine, consecrated become the body and blood of Christ. Why are there two? Why not just have one? Because through the double consecration of the elements, Christ is shown in a state of victimhood. It's the separation of his body and blood demonstrating his death. This is why we say in the liturgy that the Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection. And so what we find in all of the sacraments is that Jesus shows us, he demonstrates, he ritualizes for us that thing that he wants us to do. He wants us to seek reconciliation. So he, so he presents it to us in the sacrament of reconciliation. But the real heart of the Christian faith, St. Paul says, is to offer your bodies in living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so Christ manifests his own death in front of us so that we can learn, we can see demonstrated in the sign this life of self-offering. The Second Vatican Council said, the people of God should be instructed by God's word, nourished at the table of the Lord's body, give thanks to God by offering the Immaculate Victim 
not only through the hands of the priest, but also with him. And they should learn also to offer themselves through Christ the mediator. Then they can be drawn day by day into an ever more perfect union with God and with each other, so that finally God may be all in all. And this is how the Mass is the source and the summit of the Christian life. Because it is in the Mass that we learn and that we habituate ourselves to making this interior offering that is by far the most important part of Christian life. This is what was lacking in the mind of the young man who called him. Because no one had explained to him you must appropriate the meaning of the sacrament. It's not really the, the experience of physical reception. It's the imitation of the good things demonstrated therein. And then the supernatural power of God comes, and we cooperate with it, but by internalizing it. Finally, I want to say just a word about the relationship of Christ in the persons of his members. Albert de Bravaux was a Benedictine abbot in the 12th century who composed a famous reflection on Christian friendship. And he wrote, Here we are, you and I, and I hope Christ a third is in our midst. For Albert, there's a knowledge of Christ that can only emerge in the midst of believers. We can only experience it through dialectical engagement, the I and thou of interpersonal exchange, exchange. When I first became Catholic, I was privileged to meet a Dominican priest who was 100 years old, an Irish Dominican, who had once edited the Pope's newspaper, Le Sobertura Romano, been in Rome under, under three popes. And he was living in a local convent near my name. And I thought this guy would be an amazing opportunity to learn more about the content of the Catholic faith and what it's like to live in Rome and work for the Pope and drive in Ireland. And that was a part of the world I wanted to learn more about. So I made an, offer, made an appointment to go visit him. He was blind, so he needed people to read to him. I wanted to go read to him. And uh, as I got to know him and was reading to him, we discovered that we had far more in common and mutual interest in one another than we did in the texts. And so we put the reading aside, and we just began a relationship of discussing theology and the church and church history. And he was a brilliant intellect. He knew the writings of St. Thomas backwards and forwards, and he knew more about the church than anyone I'd ever met. But after several years of this relationship, I began to realize that the real value to me was not his profound knowledge of theology, but his ability to channel that in service to me as a human being. And even as Christ looked at that young man and loved him, so Father Lambert looked at me and loved me. And he would always ask me, how's your father? How's your mother? How are your wife and your children? How's your work? How's the bishop? And it was that interpersonal exchange of love that unfolded to me ultimately the real value of Christian relationship. And I came to realize the truth of Paul's words, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries, but I have not love, I am nothing. You know, when we're here at a conference on Catholic Brotherhood, I would point you again to the teaching of Jesus when he met the rich young ruler. He looked at him and loved him. And ultimately I persuaded there's no better way for me to conclude this talk to Catholic brothers in Christ and to encourage you to experience Christ in the sacred persons of these, your Catholic friends. St. Cyprian of Carthage said, It is with Christ that we journey, and we walk with our steps in his footprints. He it is who is our guide in the burning flame which illumines our paths. Finding our salvation, he it is who draws us towards heaven towards the Father, and promises to success to those who seek in faith. We shall one day be that which he is in glory, if, by faithful imitation of his example, we become true Christians, other Christ. Thank you very much.